You're listening to Tales from the Break Room, the podcast about real people's scariest stories from work. If you want to hear your story narrated on the show, send it to us at darkstories.org. And hey, check out eeriecast.com for even more creepy podcasts. Thank you. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? You ever get in your car when it's dark? and you can't help but feel a little creeped out by how pitch black the back seat is. It's basically the automobile version of opening the shower curtain every time you go to the bathroom. I mean, you gotta check for those boogermen and all that. Today's stories might be especially relatable then, you'll see. It's break time, and I'm in need of at least a gallon of espresso in my veins. While I try not to die from caffeine overdose, I'll share some of these allegedly true and scary work stories with you. These are tales from the break room. Always check your back seat. From Anonymous. I'm a 27-year-old guy working full-time at a major retailer in a big city. Just the other day, I left a car dealership with my new car, and I'll tell you what, this couldn't have happened at a better time in my life. What I'm about to tell you is something that scared the living daylights out of me. This story will teach you to always check your back seat. It was the summer of 2016 on a Friday night. I was working a full eight hour shift from 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. I just love closing. Not really, there wasn't many of us closing that night, but we were definitely having fun with it. When the clock struck 10.30pm, we still weren't done. We can't leave the store until everything's finished, like picking up our areas and mostly folding clothes. At around 11pm, we finally got done. I sent everyone home, starting to walk around the store with my manager. We were just kind of checking up on things. We don't actually leave the store until around 11.45 p.m. And by then, I began walking to my car as my manager locked the doors. I was on my phone texting my girlfriend that I was just leaving and I'd be home soon. She didn't reply very quick, so I was sure she was asleep by then. Now, where my job was located was not a very friendly place, pretty much the HUD, and I should be really paying attention where I'm walking. I make it across the parking lot, into my old piece of crap car. I'm not joking, it was a 93 BMW that I was surprised even lasted three years. My passenger door didn't open, the back door on the driver's side wouldn't lock, and the back passenger window would not go down. That's only a few of the issues with it, there were many more, but I won't go into all the details. But I'll also add that my alarm didn't work. Anyway, I was sitting in my car, letting it run a little bit, so it didn't overheat. I unlocked my phone and began to play some music from it. Now, that night was pretty stressful. I was trying to find some good music to listen to and relax to before starting my trip home. I pulled up my chill ladies playlist and I started to jam. I pulled out of the parking lot and as I pulled up to the light, I caught this real nasty putrid smell. It smelled of old must and urine. At first, I thought it was me, except I never urinated myself, and I didn't really have any reason to stink. I checked both ways on the street, then turned onto the road. I couldn't shake the smell no matter where I went. It was starting to make me gag, so I put a hand over my mouth. I reached into my glove box, taking my eyes off the road for a second. I pulled out a little travel-sized Axe body spray. I began to spray the car like it was bug spray and I had a swarm of bees in there. That seemed to fix it for a little while. By then I just pulled onto the on-ramp of the expressway. A song came on on my phone by Huey Lewis in the news. I love this band and that song, hip to be a square. Embarrassingly, I turned it up and I started to sing along. I was quite loud and obnoxious. Just then, I hit a pothole on the highway and the car bounced. As it bounced, it felt as if something heavy was in the back, bouncing on the floor hard. I thought to myself, probably just my skateboard in the trunk. Gotta remind myself to get that thing out of here. My phone began to ring then. My girlfriend was calling me. I answered. 
Hey, babe, what's up? I heard my girlfriend on the other end with a sleepy voice. You home yet? Sorry, I fell asleep waiting for you to call me. No, I answered. I'm on my way, though. I'll let you go back to sleep. I'll talk to you in the morning. We both said our goodbyes, and I hung up. I put the phone back down, but I didn't turn the music back on. I was almost home, so no point in killing the battery even more. I started to hear a humming sound in the darkness of my back seat. A shower of terror just shot through my whole body. Then I heard a whisper. Hey, play that song again. I love Huey Lewis. I slammed on the brakes. At this point, I'm on the far left side of the highway, and I'm swerving over to the right lane, trying to pull off. After almost killing myself and whoever was in the back seat, I finally managed to pull over and put my car in park. So there I was, sitting on the side of the highway, 12.30pm, someone creeping in the back seat. I looked into the rearview mirror, and I yelled as loudly as possible. The heck are you doing in my car? You've got five seconds to get the heck out. Silence. I couldn't see anything in my mirror. I was deathly afraid, too much so to turn around and look for myself. I yell again. Get out! I yelled so hard I heard my voice box. I slammed my hand on the dashboard. I looked straight into the mirror, scanning around and waiting for something to happen. Then this big black mass rises from underneath my seats. All I can see is this black silhouette of a person's head, and I can hear him giggling under his breath. Hey, I just want to hear that song again. Come on. I yelled back at him. Get out or I'm calling the cops. He lunged at my face with his nasty hands and long fingernails. I screamed, managing to break his grip off of me. I jumped out of the car, slamming the door shut. I got on my phone and dialed 911. Of course, the freaking line was busy. I was stuck there, dealing with a crazy bum. My back driver door swung open. The man runs out of me like a bat out of heck. I trip as I step backwards, and I swear he jumped on me like a freaking demon. The guy had long, dirty hair, and long, dirty facial hair too. His breath smelled like death. I don't think he had any teeth either. He screeched at me in some babbling language, trying to stick his fingers down my mouth of all things. Homeless man fingers don't taste great, by the way. I pushed him off of me. The guy only weighed about 90 pounds. I got back on my feet, preparing for a fight. He was on his back, looking up at the night sky and just laughing. I mean, he was laughing like we were play fighting or something. I couldn't believe it. Eventually, he got back up on his feet and stood there right in front of me. To remind you, I'm on the side of the freaking highway. Nobody seems to care what's going on with the two of us. Nobody stopped to help. No one else called the cops. I'm now at a stare down with this crazy hobo and he's smiling at me. Suddenly he says, You're okay, kid. I'll leave you alone. Let you go tonight. He began to walk away into the woods that are off the side of the highway. I'm not gonna lie, I wanted to cry. I thought this guy was gonna kill me. I shut the back door and got back into my car. I started it up and I went home. The next day, I got into the shower. My body was covered in bruises, not to mention the nice little scratch marks on my face. I called my boss and told him what happened. I told him I didn't know if I should come in or not, and he told me to take the day off. I called my girlfriend and told her what happened. She bawled her eyes out and told me I should buy a gun. I think the creepiest part about this whole story is when I went back to work the next day. They showed me the CCTV from the parking lot that night. My manager said I had to take a look, and what I saw gave me goosebumps. On the CCTV footage, they fast-forwarded to the part where my manager and I were walking out of the store. The screen showed the perspective of the camera which had been aimed towards my car in the lot. I'm not seeing anything just yet, 
so he rewound the video only about 10 minutes. And there you see him. You see this guy just casually walk up to my car from out of the bushes. He opens my back door like it was his vehicle. He climbs in and shuts the door behind him. Only minutes later, you see me walking to my car, completely oblivious to what just happened. If only I wasn't busy texting on my phone, I probably would have had a better night that night. Like I said, I just left the car dealership. I've got a newer vehicle now. I traded that car in and I couldn't be happier. The next time you're working late at your job, always check your back seat. Echoes of the Past From Paul since before I could remember, I have lived in one of the major cities of the Czech Republic. Four years ago, I worked as a tour guide for the local Civil Defense Museum. The museum is located beneath a hill near the city center in an old civil defense shelter from the Cold War era, but the foundations and corridors of the shelter date back to the Second World War. Due to a lack of personnel, I sometimes had to do much needed maintenance such as painting, cleaning, and even some harder manual work. One day we discovered in the archives the shelter was originally much bigger, but the last bombing of our city near the end of World War II caused heavy damage to some corridors. After the war, civil defense walled off those sections from the rest of the shelter, which was meant for modernization. So back then, after some bureaucracy, with the local appropriate authority, we decided to break one of the walls leading to the damaged part of the shelter. The section was in bad shape. Huge chunks of rock were blocking the path, so we had to safely clean it up. Day by day, the majority of the cave-in was slowly but finally removed. I was soon assigned to look for some artifacts in the remaining rubble. I found some very old matches, a wedding ring, German dog tags, a crowbar, gas masks, and a baby rattle. While I rummaged through the rubble, I began to hear a faint sound, like metal hitting rock. Slowly, the sound traveled closer and closer to me from the old corridors. I was pretty scared of being crushed by the rocks above me, so I went back to a more stable section. However, this didn't help at all. The sound traveled even closer, then suddenly stopped right on the wall to my right side. I slowly looked at the wall, but saw nothing. When I inspected the wall more closely, I found marks from a pickaxe. I was about to touch one of them when the sound came again, emanating from the very mark I nearly touched. I quickly ran from that spot to the exit, never going back to that section of the shelter. I told my story to my coworkers, but no one believed me, and since my boss wanted to cut some expenses, I was the first on his list. I don't know what it was, but no one could drag me back there, not even for a second. Dollar Tree Haunting From Anonymous I still work at the same Dollar Tree where this happened. I had just recently left my first job at McDonald's and wanted something other than fast food. I applied at a lot of places, and Dollar Tree was the first to call me back. After an interview, I was told the job was mine and that I started the next day. They told me to arrive at 8.30 in the morning. Being my first day, I wanted to make a good impression by showing up half an hour early. I arrived before the opening manager did so I sat in my car, waiting. After a few minutes, she pulled up, and when she unlocked the door, I walked in behind her. She turned around, locking the door behind us, because the store hadn't reached its opening time yet. We both went into the office at the front left side of the store. The office door was open, and we talked about some random topics, trying to get to know each other. While I was talking, a plastic bag began to rattle loudly. I looked at her confused. She didn't even look up from the paper she was writing. She simply said, Things like that'll happen. 
I asked. Uh, things like what? Sometimes the chip bags will rattle themselves. Things will fly off the shelves. The register will open by itself too, but that's only happened once in the 19 months I've been here. She answered. I nervously chuckled and asked her more questions about it. Before I go any further, I should state that the Dollar Tree is in one very long building connected to other stores. A rent-a-center, shoe show, AT&T, a Spanish bar and grill, among a couple of others. My manager told me, when this building was built nine years ago, one of the first stores finished and opened the public was a Cato's. This Dollar Tree wasn't even finished yet. Cato's being the newest store in town, everyone wanted to go in and look around. Less than three months after it opened, a man and his wife went in to do some shopping. The man had a massive heart attack though, and he was dead when the paramedics arrived. I started to connect the dots, becoming uneasy. She continued. Ever since then, this building's had some creepy stuff going on. She told me she absolutely does not believe in the paranormal, and that it's all just make-believe to her. But I think differently. One morning, she began, after I started working here as a manager, I was in here alone. I was getting all the money put in the registers for the day. I turned on the computer and went to register number two to get my clipboard. When I got back to the office, the name Glynn had been typed into the manager login bar. That's pretty creepy, I said. Listen to this, letters can't be typed into the manager login bar. I asked what she meant. She showed me, bringing up the manager login bar, telling me to randomly type letters into the system. I tried to, but it wouldn't accept any letters. She told me to type in random numbers and I did. Then it accepted every one. I looked at her and she asked me, now, how can a name get typed into that when it doesn't even accept letters? My hands got clammy. All day long, I couldn't stop thinking about that story. After a nine-hour shift, I went home and I went straight to my laptop, searching up the history of the building. With it being less than a decade old, it didn't take me long to find the new story of the man's death. I read about it. It was true. A man, in fact, died of a heart attack in that store directly after it opened. When it showed the name of the man who died, I broke out in a sweat. His first name was Glenn. To this day, when I arrive at work early before the store opens, sometimes I experience strange things. Not always, but some of the time. The scariest one that I have personally experienced was when I had the job of stocking the laundry detergent on the back wall. I was alone other than the manager, and I heard a cart squeaking. Being the nosy type of person I am, I looked to see who was pushing it. I found the cart sitting in the snack aisle, no one else around. I walked outside, standing in the cool morning air to calm down. I won't ever be a manager at that Dollar Tree knowing I'd have to be there alone on occasion. Be careful who you make friends with. From Anonymous This event happened two years ago, while I was still in high school. I graduated in the year 2016, along with my best friend Monica. She used to be considered my best friend anyway. I remember when we were really close. Monica was a sweet girl, always encouraging me to try out in school events with my artistic talents and to become my best. We even shared the same beliefs, though she was Catholic and I wasn't. We were so close I felt she would become one of those rare lifelong friends a lot of people have. I'll remember the day it happened for the rest of my life. It was supposed to be a normal shopping trip with my mom at our local Target, just to get some groceries and things that our family needed. I wasn't working at the time, I was only 15. But I earned weekly pay from my parents with chores and helping around the house, so I always looked forward to a trip to Target to spend my allowance money for whatever I wanted. 
As always, I reluctantly followed my mom to the Target store, cash in hand. We walked in, and I saw none other than Monica, working as a cashier in one of the aisles. She hadn't told me about her job, which was odd since we were the kind of friends that were very close. We told each other everything, I thought. Still, she gave me a big smile to greet me, as if she knew I was coming to the store that day. Without doing a double take, I just excitedly smiled and waved back. My mom and I walked around the store, looking at various items to decide what to buy. I picked out a favorite graphic t-shirt and some jewelry that piqued my interest. At some point during the shopping trip, the lights in the store began to flicker off. I could hear the shoppers going crazy and mumbling in confusion as to what was going on. This occurrence was the strangest ordeal to ever happen in a Target store alone, at least to me. Keep in mind, this was in the middle of the day, where the sun was still shining outside, no thunderstorms or anything of the like. At this point, my mom and I were in the back of the store, since our Target's girls' clothes and fashion section remained towards the back. Much of the light I could see when this event occurred was coming through the windows at the front of the store, where the sunshine was coming in. At that moment, I was flooded with panic. You know that eerie feeling you get when something unordinary happens amidst an ordinary day? And the last thing you think about is something even creepier happening. Anyway, this power outage seemed to last forever, when in actuality it was probably just 10 minutes. Still, it was scary not understanding why our entire surroundings went completely dark with no possible explanation, having to wait for something to happen in those surroundings. After a while, my mom and I calmed down, assuming this was just a glitch in the lighting system at the store, that their electricity was the one to blame. We were still at the back, just waiting, when suddenly I see what appeared to be Monica in the darkness jogging at an almost steady sprint. When she passed me, however, she said in a quiet voice, I'll take care of it, don't worry. Almost as if she was deliberately saying it only to me. After she sprinted out of sight, the power in the entire store mysteriously came back on. My mom and I were relieved. We could continue shopping. Towards the end of the shopping trip, when we went to the cashier, I noticed something at the front that I hadn't before. They had a clearance jewelry rack featuring crystal necklaces. This was back when jewelry had that crystal phase first appearing in all stores. I saw a very vibrant and colorful blue crystal necklace hanging from that clearance rack, and I knew I had to have it. I absolutely loved crystals, and this was a must for me, especially on clearance. So I told my mom I was going out of line really quick so I could take a closer look at the necklace, possibly buy it, since I had extra cash. Once I inspected the necklace closer, I noticed it had a black cross etched on the front of it, on the crystal part. I thought that was very appealing, and decided I would buy it for only $3. Once I took it off the rack, I saw none other than Monica walking towards me at full speed, almost sprinting in the same way she had before. But this time, she looked angry. The expression on her face never wore off. She looked especially teed off about something. She gave me the most menacing glare I've ever seen anyone make. This wasn't normal for Monica. It was something completely out of the twilight zone when she suddenly yelled at me, saying the exact words, What the heck do you think you're doing, you twat? She then snatched the necklace from me, breaking its crystal pendant with one swift motion onto the ground. I gasped as I watched the cheap necklace break into many blue shards on the floor, the cross design on the necklace now broken apart. At this, Monica's expression turned from a menacing glare to an almost insane grin with soulless eyes. She began to laugh hysterically out loud, but it sounded wrong, sounded unearthly. Her expression didn't look right. This wasn't the Monica I knew at all. She seemed almost demonic. The entire scenario felt demonic. After she laughed, she began to slander my personal beliefs, degrade my person with insult after insult right to my face, throwing in a slew of filthy language and profanity that I didn't even know existed. 
She said things to me like, Jesus went to hell and he's going to take you with him. And Lucifer is going to chop through your throat. She even began to call me and my family all kinds of names, telling us we were going to die of horrible diseases or of poisonous gases in our sleep, among many other filthy things. As a Christian, I was personally hurt deep down inside, not just by the religious-related comments, but by all of them. Seriously, this was so unlike Monica, so unlike any normal person. I truly believed that something had taken hold of her body, but I never could understand what. I was soon in tears. I watched her jump up and down in complete anger, her face turning red as she threw a tantrum. Suddenly, my mom grabbed hold of me, pulling me along with her as we left the store. I looked back one last time out of fear and curiosity. I watched other Target employees having to hold her back as she tried to chase after us. As they held her, she appeared to cry, threatening to murder me, specifically on the day of our graduation. My mother and I, not wanting to hear any more of that crap, rushed to our car and practically sped home. All I can say is that Monica and I never talked to each other once after this incident. It was like the best friend I once knew was dead to me and had changed into a completely different person, if she was a person at all. We would pass each other in school occasionally. She would give me a glance, but nothing other than that. The weird part about the aftermath was when she did have the chance to look at me. Once in a great while, she would give me close to the same glare that she gave me in that store. It was truly strange. And about the lights going off in the store, I feel that wasn't a mere coincidence. All in the same day, all in the same hour, there's just no way. It was like the power going out was a shift into something. I'm 19 now, still alive past my graduation, luckily. All I can say is the day of our graduation went smoothly. No dangerous happenings for Monica. Maybe the thing inside of her just wanted me to be scared. Wanted to put me down for whatever reason. It brings me to tears to mention all this again. There are crazy individuals out there in the world. Some of them might be your closest friend. The phrase, trust no one, has an entirely new level to me. I was mugged from Jack J. In July of 2017, at around 6 a.m., I left my house to go to work. As I just left, in front of my house is a road on a hill, and running down it was this man. He was looking both left and right, as if deciding which direction to go. Immediately, I thought this was quite weird. He seemed lost. But I watched him as he ended up going left, the opposite direction of where I would be headed. As I proceeded to walk to the bus stop, only about a 30-second walk from my house, I hear a voice behind me say, Yo. I just stopped walking, freezing up. Deep down I knew this was probably the same guy I saw before. I turned around and said, Yeah? He asked when the next bus was due. I told him it'd be here in a few minutes. He then asked where it went. I told him, into town. I continued walking to the bus stop then, and he followed. He asked if I had five pounds on me. I replied no, I didn't. I just had a bus pass. That's when I noticed a disturbing aspect to this man. He was covered in blood. It didn't appear to be his own blood. There were no open wounds on him, but it was on his face, his t-shirt, and his sweatpants. I also noticed the metal bar he was holding in his hand. I felt uneasy at this point, not exactly scared, until he walked up to me and I was backed up against the bus stop with nowhere to go. He raised the metal bar over his head as if he was getting ready to strike me. He began to shout, Give me your money. He kept saying it over and over again. I tried to stay calm, explaining to him that I didn't have any money, just a bus card. He then said, Do you want to die? 
You want to get beaten? The whole time, I couldn't take my eyes off of his metal bar. I was just waiting for him to hit me. Eventually, he just gave up asking for money and instead asked me for my phone. I told him no, he's not having it. He then dug his hand right into my pocket, grabbing my phone. I tried to grab it back off of him. There was a struggle for about 10 seconds before I let go. He kept saying he was going to hit me and kill me, and honestly, I just feared for my life at that point, so I let go. He asked if it was a contract phone, and I told him yes. He stood there for a few seconds, trying to figure out how to turn it off. Once he did, he ran like the wind. I just turned around, starting to walk back home, shaking like a leaf. A woman who had seen what happened asked if I was okay and if he got anything from me. I told her he took my phone and ran off. She then noticed the bus was coming and ran to catch the bus. Kind of a rude thing to do, honestly. I would have tried to help someone if they were just traumatized, but whatever. I got home and my stepdad opened the door. I started crying then, mainly just relieved I was home and safe. All I could say was I was mugged, and my stepdad ran out of the house to look for the person, but he was gone. I explained to my mom and stepdad what had just happened, and my stepdad went looking for the guy. He was out for about an hour searching, but couldn't find him. The police came and took a statement, along with my trousers for fingerprint evidence, and to try to find any traces of blood. As I had mentioned, he was covered in it. They were hoping that there was blood on his hand that could have been found in my pocket. After I calmed down, I tried to get in contact with my manager to tell her what had happened, that I would not be at work. It was already around 9am at this point. I was supposed to be there at 7am. I managed to get her number and call her. After trying to explain what happened, she wasn't having any of it. She just wouldn't listen to what I was trying to say. She said, you should have just came into work then as well as, if it were me, I would have screamed for help. Yeah, you can say what you do in a certain situation, but when it actually happens, your actions end up different. Fast forward a few months, I'm in and out of police stations giving statements, reports, doing a video lineup, etc. They finally caught the guy. He was arrested and questioned about it, but they had to let him go, as they had no hard evidence on him to convict him. But that wasn't the end of it. He was soon also arrested for damaging someone's car earlier that day. A year or so after that, the court case arrived. I attended it, along with a friend of mine who came with me for support. I went inside and he was just sitting there. I could see him out of the corner of my eye. I ignored him as I have to walk right past him. I did notice that he was wearing a tracksuit. I mean, who wears a tracksuit to a hearing? Anyway, I sit down and the hearing begins. I'm asked to explain in my own words what happened that day. And just as I try to begin telling it, I choke up and can't speak. I take a few deep breaths and start again, but this guy's laughing at me for a few seconds. After I explain my side of it, his defense person questioned me, trying to say how maybe I'm unsure it was him, and I was confused, because when I gave my description to the police, I said he was in his mid-twenties when in fact he was younger. I get it's his job to do that, but I got really defensive, saying how I know it was him because I can remember it like it was yesterday, and how I'm really not the best person at guessing someone's age. I didn't remain in the room when the guy was being questioned. I just wanted to leave. I was told by CPS, the ones investigating and trying to convict him, that they'll be in contact with the verdict. Not long after, I got a letter saying he pled guilty to the damages he caused to the woman's car, but pled not guilty to robbery, which is what he was being charged for for stealing my phone. But in the end, he was still found guilty for it. I can't exactly remember how it was worded, but he was given two 18 months suspension or something like that. Basically, he would have no jail time. <sighs> but at the least, if he was arrested within the next 36 months, he would have to go to jail and serve those 36 months. Around the same time, I began hanging out with some new friends, all who knew this guy. They were wanting to call him up and invite him over so they could kick his butt. 
As much as I wanted to say yes to that, I told him not to do it. His Facebook is public. I often go onto his profile to see what kind of things he posts. It's always the same things about how he just wants to wake and bake, how his head is all kinds of messed up from drug use, and how he wants to settle down, all this annoying crap. This may not be entirely scary, I guess, but it was traumatizing for me. I've taken up judo since then. I'm now a brown belt. Hopefully, if anything similar happens, maybe I'm able to take someone down. Possible Ghost or Spirit Sighting From E.T. Location, California I worked at a senior home for years, and up until COVID happened, everything was normal. But once COVID started to affect our facility, my colleagues and I started to notice odd things. Due to COVID, many of the residents began to decline quickly, some passing away. Some of these residents were in good health before, and were some of the closest people to me at the time. I would work long hours, and none of my own relatives lived close by. I would often listen to the residents' elderly advice. One week, I came in, hearing from a PCA or caregiver that many residents had passed that weekend. And they would have a negative response from the county about this because the facility had failed to provide the proper PPE for staff. One day that week, I believe it was a Tuesday, I came in for my food service shift. I was advised by my manager that we would be going around with a meal cart, delivering to their room rather than having the dining hall open. My favorite coworker and I started our cart service and began chatting about our weekend. She was happy I was back at work. I had taken a break from work due to personal reasons. She explained some events that happened recently with this new way of serving and how it was odd to see the residents' apartments and how, until now, we hadn't had much of a reason to be able to go into their rooms. She told me that a few days ago, when she went into Margaret's room, she had felt an odd presence from the bedroom. Margaret was one of the residents who had died due to COVID complications. My coworker explained that she felt like all the dolls on her shelf were watching her. I remember asking, why were you in her room if she was gone? I laughed a bit due to how uncomfortable hearing this was. She said they'd had to go into everybody's room that night picking up any trash and making sure everything was cleaned off the counters. Did anything else happen when you were in her room? I asked. She seemed uncomfortable then, and I looked at her. You can tell me. I'll believe you. She then answered. Well, after I felt like I was being watched by those dolls, I was leaving the bedroom when one of the dolls fell off the shelf and broke. Okay, maybe someone in the other room just slammed a door. No, there's no way. Both residents on both sides are gone now. Well, can we go look and see if anything happened when I go in? By then, we were in that hallway. She replied, Be my guest. I'm not going in, though. I think you should come in, because if something happens, you need to see it as well. Reluctantly, she agreed. Okay, fine. We arrived at the room. I unlocked the door. I swung the door wide and noticed the blinds were up, letting in pale sunlight. I asked my coworker, So, uh, where's that doll that broke? Ah, uh, it should still be in here. Nobody else has come in this room. I didn't tell any PCA about the incident. I looked around the room for a moment. Looks like it's gone. Are you sure you didn't let anybody clean up? No way. I left it like that. I was scared, and I left and locked the door behind me. I continued to scour the bedroom, looking at all the other dolls, which seemed to glare at me from the high shelf. I noticed there was a ridge between the dolls and the edge of the shelf. I told my coworker, whom I'll now describe as H, that there's no way it could have fallen off without forcing it to fall over that edge. H looked at the shelf and exclaimed, 
Oh my god, that's the one, the one that broke. She pointed at one. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. What if there's two of them? No, that's where the one that broke was. Okay, if you're right, then I'm out of here. The two of us left in a hurry and locked the door. I'm not exactly sure how interesting the story is to people listening, but to me it's one of the odd memories of that job. So how did a broken doll put itself back together and place itself back up on the shelf? Ghost Soldier from Christian A.W. This happened back in 1996. I was in the British Army, serving in Northern Ireland. My battalion was serving a two-year tour in Londonderry. During the tour, we participated in a three-month rotation. One of these rotations involved spending a month in observation bases located on the border of Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. Victor II was one of these bases. Victor II had been blown up by terrorists in the 80s. Unfortunately, a number of soldiers lost their lives during the attack. Victor II was rebuilt on the location of the first base. We would work 12 hours on, 12 hours off, during this month-long rotation. Our shifts consisted of spending four hours in the observation towers, and two hours in the base, observing close-circuit television footage. The observation towers stood 15 meters high and were armored. To get into the tower, you had to climb a steel ladder up to the observation post. There was a hatch door which could be locked to get into the top of the tower. As you climbed the ladder, your feet would make a very recognizable sound as your feet hit the steel rungs of the ladder. On this particular night, I'd been in the tower for about 45 minutes when I heard the distinct sound of someone climbing up the ladder. I half opened the hatch to greet whoever was coming up the tower. When I looked, I saw no one down there. I initially thought I must have been hearing things. I closed the hatch and carried on with my duties of watching the border. About five minutes later, I began to hear the sound of someone climbing the ladder again. This time I waited for someone to lift the hatch, but no one did. Again I went over and opened the hatch, once more finding no one there. This time I decided to use the intercom system to speak to the other soldiers on the base to see if anyone was joking around with me. No one seemed to know what I was talking about. A short while passed. When, you guessed it, the sound of someone coming up the ladder rang out again. I locked the hatch this time, but the climbing got closer and closer until someone began knocking on the hatch. Startled, I unlocked and opened the hatch. To my horror, there was no one there. Fear fell over me. I used the intercom again, telling the guys what was going on. I locked the hatch one more, and within a few minutes, I began to hear the sound of boots on the steel ladder rungs. Cautiously, I opened the hatch again. No one. I should have known. I immediately shut and locked it, but the second I locked it, loud banging began to resound from the hatch, as if someone was trying to open it by force. It was so hard, I could see the hatch rattling with each bang. I gathered my courage, opening the hatch again, and no one was there. I shut it all like before, waiting for it to come again, and when it did, chills ran up my spine. But this time, I heard a voice. I went to open it. It was one of the guys, thankfully. I told him about what happened. He asked me if I was sure. I promised him I was sure, that I wasn't lying. I went on to do my next two hours in the second observation tower. The rest of the night carried on without anything else bizarre happening. Over the next week, I was not the only person who had this experience. Three of us who worked the night shift all had similar encounters. We talked about it and came to the conclusion this was obviously the ghost of a soldier, someone who had lost their life here and was still trying to do their duties. Over the rest of the tour, 
this became a common occurrence for those working at Victor II. This observation post no longer exists as it was pulled down. I just hope the spirit of this dead soldier is now at peace. My apologies. I didn't have enough time today to finish this episode with brand new stories. So instead, please accept this. It's one of my favorite pizza delivery stories. I read it a couple of years ago on my other show, Unexplained Encounters. Enjoy, and don't forget to tip the pizza guy. Delivery to the Forest Ranch From Dollar Holler I lived in a comfy little town in northern Texas, where, as you drive along those winding roads, you would see gates with titling that would read such and such ranch. Basically, it seemed like everything other than some retail buildings was ranch land. Lots of cows, horses, and crops. It's nice if you like the scenery, but if you prefer having things to do, it's not the greatest. I mean, even if you like going camping or hiking, you'd have to drive quite a ways before hitting property that ain't private land. At the time, I worked as a pizza delivery driver. It wasn't a hard job, but dang was it stressful. Delivery just wasn't that profitable when each delivery destination was several miles apart. Driving so much every night really gets to you. In the future, I would come to realize that other delivery places in different towns had mileage restrictions far smaller than what we had at that little pizza place. No joke, I would often drive 15 miles between destinations, though now I know national chains like Domino's restrict their delivery to 5 or 6 miles or so, depending on drive time. Even with the roads having higher speed limits out in that area because of the wide country roads, it would often take me 20 minutes to get to someone's residence. I guess the good news was most folks in that area understood that ordering a pizza meant that the food wouldn't be hot and fresh out of the oven by then. Everyone was still friendly. Seriously, I don't remember a single order that wasn't positive or neutral with the customer. Regarding customers, I never had any holdups, complaints, or arguments. Nothing. Folks were just kind. In the summer, I'd have customers offer me bottled or canned drinks before heading back out. Sorry for the long setup. This brings me to my extremely creepy experience I had, delivering to a certain ranch I will not name. I'd rather not dox a friendly customer's residence just because something happened on their land. We got a call for two large pizzas, both Canadian bacon, my personal favorite. We prepared them, I jumped in my car, checked my gas, and headed out on my way. Always want to double check your gas before and after deliveries. The address was to a ranch 14 miles from the restaurant. Luckily, much of the road there had a speed limit of 70 miles per hour, so I could probably get there with the pizza still hot enough. It was 7.30 p.m. and completely dark by then. There was thunder and lightning on occasion with clouds covering the entirety of the night sky, so between flashes of lightning, it was nearly pitch black out. I got onto the highway and turned on my high beams. There was no oncoming traffic the whole way, so my high beams would be fine. They were practically a necessity, with how often deer would run out onto the road. Several minutes later, I turned right onto a dirt road. This road seemed to get thinner the further I drove along, to the point I was starting to drive extremely cautiously to avoid low-hanging branches and outreaching plants that threatened to scratch my car. I had no idea how close I was to the residence then, or how long this dirt road would go on for. I was so focused on avoiding obstacles that I nearly screamed when I saw something run across the road. It scared the bejesus out of me, to be quite honest. I saw flashes of fur and immediately thought, freaking deer. I breathed in deep and let my heart settle for a second, before continuing on the drive. The moment I stepped on the gas again, though, I heard something slap into the right side of my car. Again, I was terribly startled. I slammed the brake as before and looked over to the passenger side. It was so dark out there, I couldn't see anything outside unless it was being hit by my headlights. I couldn't even see the bushes and tree branches that were nearly close enough to my car to scrape the windows. 
Seriously? I wondered. What was that? A bird? Did a bird just fly into my car? I was determined to finish this delivery so I could get out of this place as fast as possible. After all, when two weird things happen back to back, a person quickly goes from focused or even bored to on edge. I eased off the brake, still scanning the surroundings on both sides of me. I began to push down slightly on the accelerator. Finally, I'm moving again, and for a few moments, everything seemed normal. Then slap, 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 something repeatedly and in quick succession slaps my window, the driver window, three times. I swear to God, I hit the brakes and heard someone running into the trees while laughing. I was sure of it then that someone was out here messing with me. Which possibly meant that someone ordered these pizzas just to make me the victim of their immature pranks. Too frightened to get out of the car, I rolled the window down a slight bit, leaning my face forward, then shouting, Knock it off! It ain't freaking funny! Then I rolled the window back up. The moment the glass hit the top of the door, signaling that it was back in place, I heard something that sent chills down my spine. Keep in mind, I keep my doors locked as I drive. I always have, always did, always will. And yet, somehow, the back passenger door had opened. Immediately, I heard someone hurriedly scoot across the seat to the other side so that they would sit in the seat directly behind mine. I even heard them giggle behind me. There was an undertone to their voice, like their vocal cords were all messed up or damaged, maybe from years of smoking or something. My mind conjured images of a druggie rather than kids messing with me on this dark dirt road. Have you ever been so scared that you're too afraid to look in the direction of what's scaring you? That's exactly how I felt. Someone was in my car with me. Heck, the back passenger door was still open. I could not only hear, but also feel someone's breath behind me. Yet, for a moment, I stayed motionless. Eventually, I resolved to turn all at once. I counted down in my head. Three. Two. One. I turned so fast I felt the muscles and bones in my neck ache in disagreement. My fist was raised, ready to defend myself as I looked into the back seats. They were empty. But the back passenger door still hung open. Horrified, I swallowed hard and rapidly crawled over through the middle of the car, yanked the door shut, then sat back down in the driver's seat, clicking the lock button repeatedly on the door to lock all the doors in the car. But as I said before, they had already been locked. I knew I'd felt someone else in that car with me. I was certain of it. I couldn't just turn away from them again to keep driving. Every fiber of my being screamed at me to check the trunk. The back seats of my car had levers with which you could access the trunk from the interior of the car. My paranoia grew, telling me that this interloper was still here but they were now hiding in the trunk. Trembling, I crawled over the middle again and lowered one of the seats. I peered into the trunk. It was dark, but I had just enough visibility from the ceiling light that I could tell that there was no one there. I crawled over the middle again, sitting down in the driver's seat and breathing slowly. My eyes were watery with terror, like I was passively crying from feeling so shaken up. Tap, tap. This time I didn't hesitate. Instinctively, I turned toward the tapping sound, which had come from the driver window just next to me. Someone was pressing their face into the glass from outside. They were there only an extremely brief moment before they took off giggling. I saw them. I swear to God, their entire face was covered in hair, gray hair and their eyes had been solid black. From what I could see, there wasn't an inch of bare skin on them at all. For the quarter of a second that I saw them, they didn't look completely human. I know it makes me sound crazy, but I saw what I saw. They, or 
It took off into the woods so fast they were lost in the dark before I could see much else. By then, I was flooring it through the dirt road. I'd never felt so horrified in my life, let alone confused. About two minutes later, I broke through the tree line. Suddenly, I hit the brakes as fast as I could, barely avoiding hitting a gate. I could see a two-story home about half a football field away beyond the gate. The lights were on. The gate was closed. Behind me were those darned woods. I would need to get out to lift the latch on the gate to drive through. Screw that. I'm sorry if it sounds bad on my part, but I blared my car horn over and over and over until I saw someone at the house open the door and begin to walk my way. The last thing on earth I wanted to do in that moment was get out of my car. Not with the woods so close behind me. A man who appeared to be in his fifties came out with a rifle and a flashlight. He opened the gate and walked over to my window. I lowered it. Jesus, boy, you scared the daylights out of me. Everything all right? Yes, sir. I... I just had some trouble getting up here is all. His eyebrow raised at me. You're the pizza guy. Go on ahead and drive through. I'll close the gate after you if you don't mind giving me a lift back to the house. Sure thing, was all I could mutter. Though I wasn't sure I was supposed to have any non-employees in my car while on the clock, at the moment I didn't care. Well, the man did just that. I pulled through, he closed the gate, and then he sat in the passenger seat after I placed the pizzas in the back. You look real shaken up there. You sure you're okay? He insisted. Uh, I'll be completely honest with you, sir. I was driving on the road up here where the road's real narrow and all. Then someone started running around my car, hitting it and giving me a pretty bad scare. I explained. Christ, I'm so sorry. He apologized. I glanced at him and he looked genuinely sad. I thought it was over. What? Uh, what do you mean? It's, uh, it's nothing to worry about. Just, just some trouble we've been having around here. The man stepped out after I parked. We were in his driveway now. I grabbed the pizzas and walked with him to the door. He opened it, took the pizzas, then said, One sec. He closed the door. Even though there were porch lights on around me, keeping the darkness at bay, I couldn't help but feel watched by the forest in the distance just beyond the gate. The door opened again, and I nearly jumped. The man stood there, still looking as if he had something to feel guilty about. He still had his rifle, too, but he stretched out his hand to me. Here, take this for your troubles. I kid you not, this man handed me five hundred dollars. Sir, that's too much, I, I can't... I insist, take it. Get back in your car and follow me out into those fields. There's a separate entrance over there. Might take you longer to get back, but it's safe. I know it's safe. Okay then, thank you so much, I said. I got back in the car. The older man walked around the house and beckoned me with his free hand. I steadily drove over the grass. His backyard was a well-kept field of grass with a couple of different shed-looking buildings on either side. In the distance, there was another gate. But the closer we got to it, the more I realized it was far less maintained than the other. This entrance really was seldom used. I remember thinking, why didn't he just get back in the car with me and show me where to go? The poor guy was walking another two-thirds of a football field in the dark to show me how to leave. I got to the gate. He opened it, then walked over to my window, gesturing for me to lower it. Now, this road is much more wide and the forest ends much sooner, but you'll be on an old logging road that takes a few minutes to get back to the highway. Just go left when the woods ends, and you're all set. Thank you again, I'm sorry if the pizzas are all cold by now. I didn't mean to take so long getting here. He shook his head and waved his hand at me. No, 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 D don't worry about that. I'm sorry for the trouble. 
We won't be ordering no delivery for a while. Not till we get this taken care of. Then the man walked away to the gate. I pulled through and kept driving as he shut the gate behind me. I did get a little spooked being back in the woods again, but he was right. A few seconds of a forest drive and there I was on a one-lane road. Ten minutes later I was back on the highway and the ordeal was over. I was able to head back to the restaurant. I couldn't help but wonder if they were having trouble with the front entrance. Why was the back seldom used? What was going on there? I can't honestly tell you much else. I never did get a call to go back to that ranch. None of my co-workers did either. Believe me, I asked around. In fact, none of them had ever gotten a call from that ranch in the past. I figured that meant the folks living there only made that one call then stopped calling for deliveries once again. This problem they had, that the man did not explain, it seems they'd been having it for a while. And for the next few years, I worked at that pizza place, and none of us ever did get a call from that ranch. So maybe they never got that problem taken care of. I don't know what's going on in those woods, but I pray that family is all right. I've since moved to Missouri. I work in delivery still, but the drives are far more manageable. To all my friends out there who deliver, stay safe and try to bring some sort of protection. It could be worth it. Remember to keep your gas tanks filled, because if I had been stranded in those woods with that thing, I don't know what would have happened. Tales from the Break Room is a viewer-submitted podcast featuring allegedly true scary stories that happened on the way to, on the way from, or at work. If you want your story to be narrated on the show, send it to us at eeriecast.com slash submit. As of April 14th, we're paying three cents per word for stories that are approved and make it onto the show. Submission does not guarantee approval or payment. For a limited time only, PayPal only. Tales from the Break Room is an EerieCast Network original podcast hosted by Darkness Prevails. You can follow him on Twitter at Dark Prevails, and you can hear thousands more stories read by him on our other show, Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow and rate Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You can also enjoy plenty more horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com.